Hey folks, it's Nate. Thanks for joining me for another Iron Age comic review. And today we're going to be taking a look at Biophile Koga, which is another book from the Godfo universe, folks, and is related in some way to the book Apollyon 20X, which I have already reviewed on this channel. More on that in a moment, though. Now, as always, as a matter of full disclosure, I was provided this review copy for free. I will do my best not to allow that to color my judgment, and you can make of that what you will. Furthermore, I am working from a PDF again, so I can't comment on the quality of the physical book. This file also does not contain a credits page, so if there is a separate colorist for this, I'm not sure who it is. It also does not specify the author on the cover, so I'm going to assume Mr. Evans is our author once again, and Mr. Adams is quite obviously the artist of this book. If you are not familiar with the review format of this channel, I tend to discuss the story and the art in a broad sense, then give a recommendation on who I think would enjoy the book, if anyone. Then there will be a spoiler warning, and I'm going to try and offer some very concrete critiques of the creative team in an attempt to offer things that can be done better, both in future books by this team and by anyone who might see similar issues in their own work. However, I should note that in this video in particular, I'm going to be particularly restrained in that section because I am critiquing a book that has not even gone to launch on Indiegogo yet. So I would like to try and keep as much mystery as possible for the creative team so that there will be more opportunity for them to sell their book rather than have me discuss all of it. Okay, we've got all the housekeeping out of the way. What is Biophile Koga? Well, it is the second graphic novel in the Godfo universe, but I should note, based on what I know of the Godfo universe, which is, I've read Apollyon 20X, this does not seem to have very tight or intimate ties to the previous book that they've released. So if you're worried about stumbling into a new ongoing continuity where there's going to be all these characters you're expected to know, there's none of that, all right? Let me start by saying that you don't have to have picked up the previous book in order to read this one and understand it. There are actually no shared characters, and there is apparently no shared history or continuity, at least not yet. This book deals with a very different concepts in a very different place with a different cast of characters than Apollyon 20X. Biophile Kolga is a much smaller, more intimate feeling story, even though it plays around with some very big concepts just like the previous book. Now, if I was to create my own ongoing fictional universe in this way, I would try and focus in more on one or two characters and kind of build the world out up from there. But this is not bad, okay? We have two fairly well-contained standalone stories messing with different ideas and different casts of character who are distinct and fairly easy to tell the difference between. The story itself remains in the genre of dark sci-fi. The story is very tightly focused on Kolga and her ward, her adopted daughter, whose name is June, as well as one of Kolga's allies, Stu the Stupendous. The conflict in the story revolves around two separate factors. One is Stu, and the other is an arson that nearly kills Kolga. This story moves at a really good pace, and by the end of it, one of these conflicts will be resolved while we get a good revelation about another one that is very intriguing and sets us up for another installment in the series. It's very competent storytelling, it moves at a good pace, and while there's a lot of questions it raises, it doesn't feel a need to constantly explain itself, dragging the narrative down. The story is clearly concerned with giving us enough to go on but not so much it ignores the strengths of the medium. All in all, I think Evans accomplishes this quite well. My only complaint is that in the middle of this story, while some characters are investigating the arson at Kolga's estate, we hear that there is a possibility she may be dubbed a god foe. And this really jumped out to me because, of course, this whole project is called the god foe universe, but I don't know exactly what god foe means and it seems to be some kind of legal or potentially religious term, but it's been two whole books and we still haven't had it defined. This is the one thing 
the one concept that's been introduced to me that I really feel like I should know by this point, and I don't. That said, the reader should be aware that this kind of casual use of unexplained terminology is rife throughout this book, and if that bothers you, maybe this isn't the book for you. For my part, I did enjoy the intrigue, and I wouldn't mind learning more about these concepts at a future date. Now, artistically, Mr. Adams is a very talented amateur. I don't say that as any kind of denigration, I just say he clearly hasn't put in the hours and hours and hours that a professional is able to put in to really hone their craft. He has a very pleasing style, and in this book we get to see what he can do with color, unless he has a separate colorist, in which case we see what their colorist can do. This is one thing I'm a little bit sketchy on, but either way, I think the addition of color to Kolga as a book really does help it. Now, I'm a fan of black and white art, don't get me wrong. I love the stark contrast it can bring to a story, and it can be used to establish mood in ways that color art really can't. But at the same time, color art also presents opportunities to establish mood and setting that normal art cannot. The story of Biophile Koga is very much about weird science, and the use of the color palette in this story really drives that home. There's not a whole lot of strong primary colors. There's a lot of weird, almost neon color tones, even in this setting that looks like it's kind of a Victorian New England in the, you know, 17 or 1800s kind of a setting. It's very interesting and it's very unearthly, which I think is a tone they were really going for. Artistically, I think Adams has a good idea for character design and he has a good eye for basic composition. There are some places, which I'm going to note in my more detailed critiques, where I think he could use some work, specifically in posing and in depicting an older character, because that is actually a significant element of this story. At the same time, his heavy line work, his creative use of hatching, and his incredible sense for weird anatomy definitely help this story hit home. When combined with Evan's strong sense of dialogue and his better grasp on pacing, I would say that in all respects, Biophile Koga is a market improvement over Apollyon 20X. And it shows that this creative team is well on their way to establishing a clear voice and a clear style. Let me share a personal anecdote. When I was first approached to review Apollyon 20X, I was deeply skeptical. I'm not a huge fan of dark sci-fi. It's a genre I dip my toe into every so often, but it's not something I actively seek out to consume. When I initially read Apollyon 20X, it took me about a week. The story is divided into chapters, and I would read one chapter at a time, and then I would go and do something else, sometimes passing a day or two in between readings. So, when I sat down to read Biophile Kolga, I blocked out a lot of time. To my surprise, I started it and finished it in the same day, admittedly over the course of two readings rather than just one, because I did run into a time constraint there. I had to go and do something else that I couldn't get out of. But I was much more invested in this story than in the previous one, and that is a good testament to how rapidly these guys are improving, how they're getting a better grasp on their storytelling strengths, and how solid their fundamentals already were, because it's not like they made huge changes compared to their previous book. If you're into dark sci-fi or weird science in the late Victorian era kind of stories, I think Biophile Kolga is really going to do it for you, even though the story does have some significant flaws. Sure, the art is still wonky on some pages. The layout does not always lead the eye in a very intuitive fashion. The characters may not always charm and engage every reader. And because there's so few of them to get to know, it's not like there's a broad cast anyone can find their preferred style of dialogue or their preferred philosophy of life represented in. That's just a drawback of this kind of smaller story. But I think this is a team worth watching. They have a ton of potential, and if this kind of story is your jam, then in another two or three installments, I think it's going to be firing on all cylinders and really be the kind of thing that grabs you. And if you don't get in on it now, 
you may not be able to get the physical copies you want to keep up with this story. All that said, Biophile Kolga is still a dark sci-fi, weird science fantasy kind of a story. If that's not your jam, I don't think it does anything new or revolutionary that is going to grab you and draw you into the genre. Evans and Adams know what kind of story they want to tell, and they're pretty uncompromising in telling that kind of story, which I wholeheartedly respect, but cannot recommend to everyone. So, those are my recommendations on how you should think about whether you want to follow up on this project. I've linked to the pre-launch page on Indiegogo down below, and if this sounds like your kind of thing, by all means go and check it out. At this point, I'm going to offer my critiques, which means some spoilers. Not a lot of spoilers, but some spoilers. If nothing else, I have to present a few pages with no idea whether they are what is intended as preview pages or not. Okay, let's get into it. Page one of this story is a very effective page. Right away, it gives us our main characters and the theme of the story. Kolga is a character who has died many times, but also one too few. That is a really strong opening line. When combined with the title of the series, Biophile Kolga, we can tell that this is a story that is very concerned about life and death. Biophile literally meaning life-loving, right? And Kolga is just the main character, so the title right away tells us the main character loves life in some way. Add in this burning building and how she mentions dying a lot but not enough, and we get a very clear sense that that idea is what this story, maybe not every story in the Kolga series, but this story in particular is going to be exploring. It's a very strong bit of writing. That said, this page also has my first major art critique for Mr. Adams, namely the way he draws an old face. It was not immediately apparent to me that in these side-by-side -side shots where we see one half of Kolga's face with a lot of hatching on it, and the other half of Kolga's face where there is no hatching, that she was supposed to be old in the left-hand side. Generally, I think this kind of smudging or hatching indicates some kind of bruising or dirt or general wear and tear. Now, yes, as you age, your body is basically undergoing wear and tear, but intuitively, that's not how the human eye understands age. As a human being ages, the biggest thing that happens is the subcutaneous fat under their skin begins to disappear, and as a result, their skin hangs very loosely. This is especially true around the face. But in general, it's why old people seem very wrinkly about the hands and the face. The loose folds of skin are pulled down, creating those wrinkles. It is not, well, okay, it, it is a factor of the skeleton and contours of the face, but it's that combined with the looseness of the skin and the effects of gravity. So because Kolga's face is not drooping here, I did not see an older face. I just saw a dirty face. And I do really sympathize with the difficulty of this because I've done a story where I had to draw a character in his late 60s repeatedly, and it is kind of tough to get that kind of line on the face. Um, for my part, to help with that, I just modeled it after a person I knew and had some photographs of that I could use as reference. I did a bunch of test sketches, and eventually I got something I thought worked pretty well. I think it would be worthwhile if you're going to continue drawing Kolga at this stage of life to pick an actress or some other person you know with a similarly shaped face at about 65 to 70 get some photos and try recreating those to really get a sense of how those folds form as the skin begins to hang loosely. Now, on this page, we have an example of really good typesetting. And I know that sounds weird to point out, but I think it's worth pointing out that most of this typesetting is really good. There are a number of different fonts and speech bubble styles used for different kinds of voices throughout this book. It's a little thing that's very easy to overlook but Adams or Evans, whoever does the typesetting on these books, does a really good job for the most part picking out very legible fonts that are still distinct enough 
to let us know that, hey, these are different voices speaking in different ways. He also goes the extra mile to kind of line up the sound effects with the motions that are happening on the page. I really like that. That's something I geek out about a lot. And believe you me, we are not done geeking out about it. I do have a couple of writing critiques here. One is there are a couple of words, magics, as you can see in this speech bubble on the bottom, and also the name June is some for some reason spelled J-O-O-N. Um, these are kind of distracting, and I think they detract from the narrative without really adding a lot of value to it. I'm not a huge fan of alternate spellings like that, unless there's a really, really, really strong reason for it. Such as, uh, if you've ever read Railsea, the use of the ampersand instead of the word and in that book is a good example, I think, of why you might change something like that up. I don't know if that's what's going on here, because we didn't find out the significance of the ampersand in Railsea until about two-thirds of the way through the book. I'll just say I found it rather distracting. Also, these red speech bubbles with the weird squiggly lines about them are an internal monologue from Kolga, and I don't have a problem with that per se. Obviously, internal monologues can really help you get a sense of what's going on in a character's head. The real problem I have with these is that this is more like a voiceover. It definitely is Kolga addressing the reader, because as you saw on the first page, she does that directly. So it's not a true internal monologue. It's more like a dictation. And Kolga definitely has some themes and ideas she wants to present to us, but often these thoughts are presented spread out across one page or several pages, and it can be hard to follow the thread of the idea. I like what it's going for, but I think it would be better to speed up the delivery of these thoughts or kind of front load them, back load them, or split them in half so we can get a large chunk of them without having to jump back across a page and look at them more. And I honestly think that sometimes the disjointed nature of the text layout in this book can hinder that. More on that in a second. Like I said, there's going to be a lot of typesetting geekery in this video. But before we talk about the layout of the text, we have to talk about the formatting. This is a nitpick, but the word my here is, you know, bigger compared to the rest of the line. Okay, that's fine. It's a good way to emphasize a word here. My problem is it is justified to the base of this line. You can see the bottom of the word my is the same as the bottom of everything else. And so it just shoots way out over the top and it's very distracting. Usually when you increase the size of a line like this in a comic book, you want to center that word or those words with the rest of the line. So instead of being all the way up here, the middle of the word my would be equal to the middle of the word estate. And lastly, let's talk about this page. This is not an error unique to this page. In fact, it occurs on, I'd say, four, maybe five pages through this whole book. But I'm going to use this one as an example, because what we have here is a case where we are not leading the eye, we are actually splitting attention. So, I'm not going to go too deep into leading the eye here. I actually have an entire video called Comic Concepts Leading the Eye, where I go over it in depth. For the purposes of this discussion, what has happened is we have two different lines leading us into these two different panels at the same time. And what do I mean two different lines? Well, mainly what has happened is there are two different places where a piece of text breaches the border between panels. You can see right here in the speech balloon and right here in this piece of narration by Kolga. If we followed the natural line of the page, we would follow it around the top down to Kolga's speech balloon and then straight down into the right-hand panel because reading everything Kolga has to say already puts us into that panel. However, it's very clear if you read the page again that you're not supposed to go there first. You're supposed to come over to this piece of narration and then go down through this panel and then back up to the top of the next panel and on through the page. This is really counterintuitive page layout and the momentary confusion as people try and work out what's going on on the page takes people out of your story, which is not good. This happens again at the bottom of the page where we have this speech bubble poking up into the above panel. 
So it almost looks like we can read the panel straight down to the bottom of the page like this, even though once you actually look at the words, you can see that we are actually supposed to come across from the speech bubble at the bottom of the above right-hand panel. Now, pretty much all of this can be fixed just by moving where the text is and where the tails are between the balloons. For example, here at the top, I would just put the speech bubble over here so it more naturally leads the eye, and then I would just put a tail between these two speech bubbles and maybe push this one down some. That way, you don't have it breaking into that panel up above. I should add that these speech bubbles are of a very regular size and look like they were probably just drawn using a circle tool or something like that. I'm not sure what program specifically was used to create this document, but I'll just say irregular speech bubbles are your friends. Don't be afraid to put like a flattened top on them. Don't be afraid to, you know, even lock them to the corner of a panel or something like that. So it's absolutely clear which panel they go in. That would have cleaned up a lot of this confusion as well. And like I said, this error does occur several times, but it's a very easy fix in each case. I'm not going to go through them one by one. Again, I have more of a detailed breakdown in comic concepts leading the eye, and I'm sure any book about drawing comics will have some kind of primer on how to lead the eye as well. If you want to pick up something like, you know, drawing comics the Marvel way or something like that, just remember that it applies as much to your speech bubbles and text as it does anything else. That's something that I feel a lot of these primers on the concept leave out. Uh, a few other artistic bits and bobs here. Um, we have some weirdness in the way the scythe is swung on these two panels. It's not a big deal, and most of the action scenes come off very legibly. But in this panel, the line of the swoosh of the scythe doesn't seem to match the angle of the cut on the person. And on this kind of splash page here, this slash sound effect and the break in the panels between it runs across rather than with the motion of the scythe as we see it coming down in these smaller panel breaks here and in the way Kogla is actually holding the scythe at the bottom of the panel or splash, whatever you want to call it. That seems to just break up all the action. I would have preferred to see this rotated 90 degrees and running with the rest of everything else. I know then you can't use it to be a break between these two panels, but I think not having these panels here or just lining them up with the motion would have worked better. This just feels like we're working at cross purposes and it's distracting. Lastly, it took me a while to figure out what felt awkward about this, but eventually I realized that as they are shaded right now, Kolga looks like she's bringing the same hand and leg forward as she runs while pushing back with the same hand and leg, and that is not biomechanically how a character runs. Now, I recognize that may not have been the intent with the shading we have here, but because this right hand leg, leg on the left hand side of the panel, is shaded in a lighter tone than the other leg, it seems to be more in the foreground. Generally, if you want to push something into the background, you would put a darker shading tone on it, even if that's not entirely 100% correct for the lighting of the area. I don't know which happened here. Either way, it could have been sold to me more. All of these are minor nitpicks. I still find that Adams has very expressive art. You can usually tell the mood his characters are in when you look at their faces, which is a very, very good thing. There are some much more expensive comic books that I have seen where that has not been the case. He also has a real flair for good character design. And the shadow suits, which are a kind of bio armor some people wear in this story, also have a very memorable and eye-catching design. Really good work all around by the artist. Just a couple of things to keep in mind as you continue to push for the next level. Likewise, I think Evans has written a really good story. There's not a huge amount of character development in here, but I do have a strong sense of who June is, who Kolga is, and even who Stu is. In fact, I think I have the most interest in Stu at this point in the story because he seems like a very mysterious, enigmatic trickster character, and it's always fun to see those develop. But I know how he's different from Kolga and from June, and I kind of have an idea of what the character dynamic between any two of those three characters is going to be. And again, I can think of comic books with a lot more money and talent 
put behind them where that's not the case. These are the building blocks from which really memorable stories are told, not so much a really well-built world or fancy powers with a lot of tricks and traps to them. There's also a lot of intrigue in this book. What is a leviathan tooth? Why does drinking bio-armor ground up into a powder cause you to see visions? What are the witches, and what is their connection to the biophile project and Kolga herself? All of these threads are introduced fairly naturally, and yet not teased out so much that we feel like we're being distracted from the main thrust of the story. It's a delicate juggling act, I will admit, but I think Evans and Adams have done a pretty good job of walking that tightrope in the future. I look forward to seeing their continued growth, because I think one of the best things about indie comics is you do get to see these small teams develop their skills both individually and as a group. I did enjoy my time with Biophile Kolga, and for that, gentlemen, you have my thanks. Once again, the link to the pre-launch page for this project is linked in the description below. There's a like button and a subscribe button down there. While you're at it, you can use those as you see fit, and I'll talk to you later.